if we think about it, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring it up again later. Um, well, I want to read today from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to start reading with verse 14. And the Apostle Paul, of course, is writing to the Corinthians. And um, let's just read a little bit, then I'll we'll comment. He says in verse 14, of course, let me just, before I start reading, just comment on the fact that if you're uh, reading the writings of the Apostle Paul, if you don't start at the very beginning, it's a little bit hard to, to hook up because he builds his, his points on what he says before. And so, like in this verse, verse 14, starts with the word for, uh, which refers back to what he said previously. And if I were to go back to the previous verse, it also starts with the word for, so everything's connected. So we just have to jump in somewhere. Um, and he's in the middle of a, a discussion. And actually, this little um, discussion that he's in here began way back in chapter 3 um, when, he, when he mentioned the fact that uh, he and uh, others like him that are ministers, that are preaching, that are presenting God's message. Um, in fact, let's just go back there and let's just get that thought. So we'll see where he started and then we'll know where. Alex, this is... Um, Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six. Well, I'm gonna let's start with uh, verse four. <laughs> it's very hard to know where to start here. Second uh, Corinthians chapter three, verse four, and let's just get the thought that he's beginning uh, here. He says, "And such trust have we through Christ to Godward." Now that's a little bit awkward. What he means is, here's what we're Here's, our, here's the basis of our confidence as it relates to God. That's what he means. Uh, through Christ, uh, relating to God. Verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. In other words, it's not that we think we're so great. Not that we think we're s special. Not that we even think we're sufficient which is comforting to me when I read that he, you know, is saying, you know, not that I necessarily as Paul feel like I'm sufficient, but he says our sufficiency is of God. Now that's just another way of saying that as a minister, Paul is saying this is really God's business. This is God's thing. This is God's plan. This is God's work. And so I don't have to trust in myself that I'm good enough. This is his work. So he's the sufficiency. He's good enough. You know, he's got uh, enough uh, to make it work. Uh, our sufficiency is of God. Verse 6 says, Who has made us able ministers of the New Testament? That's what he says we are. Uh, the, himself and, and others who are uh, ministering. By ministering, meaning presenting God's message, if I can say it that way. We uh, are ministers, he says, of the New Testament. Then he says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the, letter, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, Paul, uh, as we know, is a, a, a Jewish person who was born and raised under the Old Testament law and the, old, the message of the Old Testament. But now he is, having come into contact with Christ, as we know from reading the book of Acts, uh, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and uh, he is now a minister of, as he says here, the New Covenant or the New Testament by virtue of that intervention uh, of Christ in his life. And he says uh, it's not the same thing. He says, not of the letter. In other words, we have this expression in the English language, the letter of the law. Have you ever heard that expression, a figure of speech? When, when that's used in ordinary conversation, that's where it comes from. It comes from this passage here. Uh, when we use that in ordinary speech, what we mean is a rigid, wooden, formal, uh, uh, you know, inflexible uh, application of something. When we say that the letter of the law, meaning adherence to a strict, um, you know, no deviation sort of uh, thing. Paul says that's not what the New Testament is, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. In other words, it's not a, uh, something that's formal or stiff or 
constraining, like a straitjacket. He said, but it's something that is of the spirit, which speaks of not the outside, but the inside. And if you go on reading, which I'm not going to do right now, but it's very interesting, he makes this point uh, in, in more depth, that what we're talking about here is something that is working on the inside of us, not something that we try to perform on the outside and rigidly conform to something, but something that's on the inside of us, a living thing um, that is alive within us. He says, we are ministers of that New Testament, which is uh, of the Spirit. And he says, the Spirit gives life. Now, uh, and he discusses this all through chapter 3, chapter 4, and it's all interesting, and I, I like reading it. I'd like to stop and, and read it. But uh, what I want to get to is uh, over in chapter 5. He's still talking about that same subject. And verse 14 starts with the word for. Again, and there's a long string of, he's building points on his argument. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, the word constrain means uh, directs us or controls us. In other words, just like he said earlier, we're not controlled or constrained by something that's outward, that's rigid, that's physical. But what constrains us, if we want to use that language, is the love of Christ, something that's uh, intangible, something that's of the spirit, something that is actually uh, on the inside of us. The love of Christ constrains us uh, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now. Uh, this is something we read, I think, maybe last week, or maybe it was the week before. And uh, this is one place where, you know, uh, I'm reading from the King James translation because that's kind of the standard. But there are sort of little places in the King James translation where I think the way they translate it is not exactly clear. And you understand that when translation takes place uh, out of one language to another, the translators have to use their best judgment on what the person writing, like Paul in this case, what he's actually saying. And in this case, and it may be the fact that the King James translation was made 400 years ago, but I don't think this is exactly clear. I think, this is my opinion, and I'll, sh and I'll back it up in a moment, I think what would be more clear to say is, because we thus judge that if one died for all, meaning Jesus on the cross dying for all, then all died with him, or all died as a result. In other words, his death substituted for the death of everyone else. And uh, for my backup on this, I will uh, turn to the Amplified Translation, and Alex will bring that up there. And, and you, I just want you to notice that that last phrase, that's how they say it. For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us. That's pretty good. I like the way that's translated. That's a good thought as Christians, you see. We're not uh, compelled and controlled and urged by some external something outside of us that we're trying to live up to. It's something on the inside that exerts a pressure uh, that it's the love of Christ that uh, compels us to do the right actions. We don't have a law on the outside saying you must or else you'll be punished. We have a love that's on the inside that says this is, this is what you want to do. This, this is an interesting point. The love of Christ controls and urges and impels us because we are of the opinion and the conviction that if one died for all, then all died. Now that's an interesting thought. Paul's saying here that if Jesus, this is his logic, if Jesus on the cross died for all of us, then his death was, in a sense, a substitute for ours. Or we could say it took our place. That is to say, a death uh, paying for sin, uh, and that's what, um, that's what the point he's making. So let's go on reading. Uh, that's really not what I want to stop on, but that's, I think, what he means by that. I just want you to understand what he's saying. Um, verse 15, Alex, I'm back to King James now. And that he died for all, that they which live, meaning uh, Christians like us, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In other words, our allegiance is to the one who did this for us, who substituted himself for us, died on our behalf, and we live for him because he died for us. That's sort of the logic of that. Verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know he 
him no more. That is to say, at one time Jesus was here in a physical body walking around and people could contact him that way, but that's not the way we know him anymore. He's not walking around in the flesh anymore. So now what we're talking about is something that's spiritual, something that's intangible, something that doesn't have to do with the outside but with the inside. That brings us to this very familiar verse, and we probably should have sung this this morning. If I had my thinking cap on, I would have had the song, because we got a song that is based on verse 17. And here's what it says. Therefore, if any man, meaning any person, be in Christ, in Christ is Paul's terminology for being a Christian. He calls being a Christian being in Christ, meaning connected to, in relationship with. It's like a way of saying, by virtue of your relationship with Christ, which is based on our faith in Him and the fact that He died for us on the cross. That's how the relationship works. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, listen to what he says, he is, that person is, a new creature or a new creation. It says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. By virtue of your relationship with Christ, if I may paraphrase it this way, Paul is saying, by virtue of your relationship with Christ, you are someone new. You are not who you used to be before your faith in Christ. You are new by virtue of this relationship with Christ. That old life, you can consider it passed away. And he says, behold, uh, everything's new. Uh, an analogy that one could make is like, like a marriage. A marriage is a union. Uh, when a woman gets married to a man, she gets a new last name. Isn't that true? We understand how that works. And let's just say that there's a big difference between the two of them, just for the sake of discussion. Let's say that the, the man is rich, wealthy, like a prince, and the woman is of low stature with nothing. And she is married to, a, in, she's come into a new relationship, Everything is new, that's what we could say, and we understand that that way. She now has a new place to live. She now has a new address. She has a new name. She has a new wardrobe. <laughs> Everything is new, do we understand that? Well, that analogy, in fact, that's not my, uh, I didn't make that up, Martin Luther uses that analogy to explain our relationship with Christ. Because we come into a relationship with Christ, we have a new identity, we have, by virtue of that relationship, we are new, we have a new wardrobe, so to speak. Everything in our life is new. And as we progress in our Christian life, it's really just a matter of discovering all the riches uh, of this new relationship. It's all very positive. Now notice what the next verse says, verse 18. And all things are of God. Do you know what that means? That means God did the whole thing. It's all His work. Notice the next verse. Who hath reconciled us to himself. That's how I know that that means it's all God's work. It says, who hath reconciled us? We are the objects. He is the one acting. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation? Now, first of all, let's just talk about he hath reconciled us to himself. Here's mankind, here's God. Here's mankind uh, with faults, flaws, and let's just say the word sin, out of harmony with God. Here's God who is righteous, perfect, and holy. Here's mankind who is unrighteous, imperfect, unholy. How can those two come together? Well, in the Old Testament, this is why Paul says, not of the letter which kills, in the Old Testament, if you took unholy, unrighteous, imperfect man and holy, perfect, righteous God and brought them together, there's a conflict. They're, they can't get together. Something's got to give. In fact, what you find in the Old Testament is when uh, human beings came in contact, too close a contact with God, they died. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read those stories and wondered about them. Have you ever read the story in the Old Testament about how uh, Saul, the king of Israel, uh, took the Ark of the Covenant. You know, the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies, and that was where the presence of God was, was to be manifest. 
and where they would sprinkle the blood of the, it was the most holy place of all in the very center of the temple. It was the place where the high priest sprinkled the blood of an animal once a year on the Day of Atonement for the, to symbolize the forgiveness of sins or the setting aside of sins. Really, it was, a, it was pointing at Christ who would come and actually do that. Well, this King Saul got in a battle with the Philistines and he went and got the Ark of the Covenant and he treated it like it was a lucky rabbit's foot. <laughs> you know what a lucky rabbit's foot is? A good luck charm. And he, he, that's, that's, a, that's how crude his thinking was. And he brought the Ark of the Covenant out into the battle thinking this will give us the victory. Well, it didn't give him the victory. Uh, they lost the battle because his heart was wrong. He was wrong. And the, Israel lost the battle. And not only that, but the Philistines took away the Ark of the Covenant. So how about that? And now the Philistines have got the Ark of the Covenant. Well, first thing that happens is now, see, this Ark of the Covenant represents God and His holiness here it is amongst the Philistines, these heathen. First thing that happened is they all got sick. Uh, they were, let's see, I think the Old Testament says they were stricken with emrods. Now, we don't know, we don't use that language today. Uh, if you look it up, if you look up what that word means, it means hemorrhoids. <laughs> Which is a terrible, terrible thing there. And so, <laughs> at any rate, and that's really the truth. I'm telling you the truth about it. That's what, if you look it up, that's what it means, the emrods. It says they, were all, they all got sick, in other words. And they figured it out right away. The, the Philistine says, we, we, don't, we don't want this thing here. This thing doesn't belong here. It's, you know, they, were coming, they had come in contact with this object that represents the holiness of God, and they were all dying from it. They were afraid of it. So they cautiously put it on a cart and put two animals, two uh, uh, cattle and oxen in front of it, and they whipped them real good on the rear end and set them off down a road, and there went the Ark of the Covenant, nobody driving. And so uh, uh, this guy looks out his window and sees the Ark of the Covenant with these oxen walking down a road, and there, here it comes back again. So he contacts David, who is now the king, and uh, <laughs> David's excited about it. He says, we're going to bring the ark, put it back where it belongs. Good. That's right. He's right to do that. Think that way. So this man, uh, I, now I, I'm having a mental ball. I should have looked this up. I didn't plan to tell this story. Anyway, uh, Uzziah, that's his name. Uh, Uzziah uh, went to, uh, to help bring the ark back and uh, got on the cart. And he's going to drive the cart now. And so the, the, it says the oxen stumbled. And so Uzziah put out his hand to steady the ark. You've heard this story. And he died. He touched the ark. Now, what did he do that was wrong? Well, not very much, but he is a, he is a, 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 a common, ordinary, imperfect, flawed human being coming in contact with perfectly righteous and holy God. Something's got to give, you see. Now, what are we talking about? Uh, Paul here says that God hath reconciled us to himself. You see, in the Old Testament, there was a reconciliation had not and could not be made. The blood of those animals were symbolic, and it did not take away their sins. However, when Jesus died on the cross, as we just read about, his blood really did take away sins. And so Paul is here arguing or saying that God has now reconciled us Though we're flawed, though we're imperfect, though we're unholy, though we're unrighteous to varying degrees and extents, He has now brought us together. God has done that. We didn't do it. He did it. Our actions didn't do it. He did it. It's all His independent action. Who has reconciled? That's what reconciliation means. You know that word, reconciliation. Do you ever use that word in, in everyday talk or speech? Well, sometimes we might, like if there were, a, like in a marriage, if a husband and wife are fighting and they're, you know, not talking to one another and there's some kind of breakage, if they're brought back together again, we call that they're reconciled. You know, we, you've heard that expression. The other way, uh, I used to hear it, of course, growing up, um, or say used to, we, I, when I first got a checkbook at the bank, uh, you know, uh, and got my checking account, uh, my uh, mom taught me how to reconcile the checkbook. You know that language? You know how that works? The bank sends you a statement and they tell you, they tell you what they say you have. And you've got your checkbook where you've written down what you think you have. So you have to go through it carefully and, and make sure you line up with them. Because if there's any conflict, they're right and you're wrong. <laughs> have you figured that out? Well, it's truthfully, if there's any conflict, you ought to call them on the phone and see what it is. But, but you do that, we call that reconciling, right? And, and what are we doing? We're making the two match, right? 
We're bringing them into harmony, right? That's the same sense in which Paul here says that God has reconciled us to himself. He has made our account balance with his. Now that's amazing when you think about it. You see, because you might think of your own life and you might say, well, I'm not that holy. Well, that's just because you're not yet seeing and recognizing what he's done on the inside of you by virtue of your relationship with Christ. See, in the previous verse, he said, you are a new creation, a new creature. Uh, old things have passed away. In other words, whatever was not in balance is gone. And, and what's new is in perfect harmony with him. Now, would you agree that what I'm describing here, does this qualify as good news? I think so. To me, it does. Does it qualify as uh, coming under the category of God's uh, love for us and something good that God has done on our behalf, a, a beneficial action? I, I agree. I think so. To me, it does. In other words, you wouldn't take what I just got through talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes and say, now, do I get the impression from that that God is angry? No. I get the impression that he is full of compassion and love, and he has done this beneficial action for us. This is radical good news. And look at what he says next at the end of this verse. Who hath reconciled us to, to himself by Jesus Christ. Notice he did that. And listen, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry, as we've seen from the previous verses, Paul is describing what he is preaching. And, of course, Paul is not around today. The message, let's just say the message that God wants conveyed to the world. It's a message of good news. Did you notice that Paul calls it a ministry of reconciliation? Let me just double check before I go on. Let's see here. Yep, that's what it says. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing that is... If you, and, and, and you don't have to look very far, if you listen to the message of, in general, the church world, if I can just, just lump it all together, or if you read in history uh, about messages and, you know, of various, you know, of periods and times, and you get the impression from a lot of things you read and a lot of things you might have heard that God is angry. A lot of times the impression is left, and I, again, I'm trying to be careful and not sound like I'm pointing fingers at anyone or finding fault with anyone. And, you know, and I don't know what you think about, uh, I'll just mention one, say something positive. I don't know what you think about uh, Joel Osteen, but I'll tell you one thing about Joel Osteen. He's always very positive. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody ever heard him? He's very positive. And whether or not you like him or not, that doesn't matter, but I'm just going to say he's very positive. He never does say God's mad. He never does give you the impression that God's angry. And did you know, and, and I'll just tell you this because I, I run in circles where ministers hang out. Joel Osteen has suffered a lot of persecution and angry comments and hostility from fellow ministers because he does not say that God is angry. A lot of other ministers don't like what he says solely because he does not say God is angry. Now, why would anybody want to say that God is angry? Why would anybody want to give that impression that God's mad? We've just, and see, there's more I could read. I'm just staying with one thing to make it simple. Did you know Paul says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, not retribution, reconciliation. Now, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm not going to call on you to try to, you know, uh, remember. I'll tell you in my own life, I have heard so many messages from preachers who say, God is mad, God is a, God's about to judge America, God is judging America, God's about to judge you, God's going to pour out judgment on you, on your life, on America, on specific cities like San Francisco. <laughs> and if you don't know why San Francisco, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I, uh, this is not original with me. I, Preachers sometimes have said, and I know this is true, if God doesn't judge San Francisco, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> well, what I would say is, if he does, then he's going to have to apologize to Jesus, because that's where the judgment happened, you see. The reason you have something like Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament is there's no reconcilia reconciliation has not yet taken place. 
Now, look at the next verse. If you want to know what, what we mean by the ministry of reconciliation, I just want to call your attention to the fact that it says that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. There is no other way to understand that. He has given us a ministry not of retribution, but reconciliation. So just in case you don't know, or, or might be any question in your mind about what he means by that, verse 19 starts this way. Um, to wit. Now again, here's more language that we don't say every day, but you might have seen this. Don Gay, have you ever seen the words to wit in a, in a legal document? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's in, in contracts. Lawyers say this, to wit. And what it means is when you are going to specify what exactly is meant, a lawyer will say in a contract, to wit. And that's where you lay out the details and the fine print and what exactly is meant. So when Paul says, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He then says, to wit, meaning specifically, here's what I mean. Ready? That God was in Christ. That means God was at work in Christ. Listen, reconciling who? The world. Reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. You know and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Here he said it twice. He says what it means is that God was at work in Christ and what he was doing there, and specifically he means on the cross. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, the people that were standing around there couldn't see what God was doing. It had to be revealed later. All they saw was Jesus was dying on the cross. They couldn't see that God made him the sacrifice for sins. And what God was doing, Paul says, is he was reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. I started to say what some people think God's primary job is, is exactly what Paul says he's not doing. Most people, if you stop them on the street saying, what's God's job? They might tell you something like this, among other things. Well, he's up in heaven watching everything that we do, and you might have thought you got by with it, but God saw it and he wrote it down. And you're going to get what's coming to you. Well, if that were the way it was, then what Paul should have said is, he has given to us the ministry of retribution. <laughs> no, he did not say that. He said the ministry of reconciliation. That means the message of the church to the world, not just to the Christians here on church on Sunday morning. Now, that's who we have here on Sunday morning. But not just us, but to the world at large. He wants them to know that God is not angry, that God is not upset, that God is not mad. Not only is he not upset, angry, and mad, but he is not counting their trespasses on their account. That's what impute means. He's not keeping score. Alex, could you give me the amplified translation? It gives us a little extra language here that I think is good. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring, listen, the world to favor with himself. What do we mean, by the way, when we say the world? Well, to me, that means universally, that means everybody. Isn't that how you'd understand it? I think that's really the, the way to understand that. Universally, everybody at large, with no distinctions, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, of the restoration to favor. Now, the message is not, if you'll do X, Y, and Z, then God will have favor on you. The message is, He's already restored you to favor. Now, the good news for us as Christians, you notice He says the world, and so we could talk about the world out here, but let's just talk about us. We are also here in the world. That means He's restored you to favor with Himself. That means that He has done it. He didn't base it on anything that you did or are doing or could do in the future. It's not based on your actions at all whatsoever. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians in this verse that I've quoted on the banner behind me, saying that uh, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, here Paul is talking about something that God did all by himself, that he has restored us and the world to favor with himself, and he's committed to us that is to say, the church, this message. Now here's my question. Why over the last 2,000 years has the church preached every other message except for this? 
You know, there's lots of messages that come out of the church, and by the church I mean at large. Generally, uh, many of them tend to along the lines of God's man. I think what they think is, if you can get people scared enough, they'll straighten up and fly right. <laughs> but if that were the case, is that right? Oh, I see. Yeah, keep, get them, keep coming to church and giving them the offering. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, there's another one. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, or manipulating in some way. But you see uh, how liberating this is, how positive this is. This is the message that, that is supposed to be going to the world at large. Now, we can't really do anything about that. Of course, you know, we're doing our little small part. You know, Alex is making a video and it'll go on the Internet and... Ten people will watch it, but that's okay. That we're doing our part. But the, here's the thing: the reason it's important for here's the thing I'm more concerned with. I want you to know. Uh, I want us to know. I want me to know that God not only is He not mad, but He's already restored you to favor. You have His favor, and it's not based on your performance whatsoever under any circumstances. And of course, we try to do our best, and we want to do everything right, and you know, and we we have a conscience. You remember what Paul said earlier: we are compelled by the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels us. You know why God uh, doesn't feel like he has to keep score and to threaten you and to present anything negative? Because he's already installed something on the inside of you that's going to impel you in the right direction. He doesn't have to threaten you anymore. You're now in a love relationship with him where you are impelled by the love of Christ on the inside. Now, let me just say in passing that in a love relationship, there can't be any fear in that. There can't, it's not a love relationship if there's a threat involved. In other words, let's just say some bully of a man gets out a gun, and puts it to his wife's head and says, well, hey, baby, do you love me? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, under threat. Of, <laughs> but you see, what God has done is he's taken away all the threat, all the, the, the fear, and he has exposed us to his love and his favor and now we're free to love him back. You know, John says it this way. We love him because he first loved us. And I'll tell you something. The more conscious you become of his love and his favor for you uh, that's free and, uh, and at no charge, not based on your actions at all, the more conscious you become of that, the more it actually does become a motivating factor in your life. And it does impel you to do the right things you, because you don't need a threat anymore. It's just his love uh, on the inside. And uh, you know, there's a lot more. Well, let's, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's finish this passage, and then we'll call that good. Alex, let's go back to the King James again. Although I really like that. I like what that says. To it, the God was in Christ, reconciling the world, and of course that includes you and me, to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, the word of reconciliation. By the way, when he says not imputing their trespasses unto them, well, how can he not do that? Well, he's already imputed them to Christ. That's the point. And here's what he says next. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In other words, he's already reconciled himself to you, so it's as though Paul is now saying, so what are you waiting for? <laughs> you know, he's already reconciled himself to all of us, so we might as well be reconciled to him. You know, if you read in the book of Genesis about Adam and Eve when they first sinned, it wasn't God that separated from them. It was them that separated from God. Did you notice that? It was them that went and hid. They did. They separated themselves. They went and hid themselves in the bushes. And God said, Adam, where are you? He said, I hid myself because I was afraid. It wasn't because God didn't know <laughs> where he was. <laughs> I think he knew where he was. Anyway, he says, God's already made a reconciliation. Now, what are we waiting? We might as well draw near to God because there's no reason not to. All right, and then finally, this is a great verse here at the end. For he, that means God, hath made him, that means Christ, to be sin for us. That's really remarkable. It wasn't just something uh, in a symbolic way. He, it was an actual thing. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, just so you don't stumble over this language, what does it mean to be made the righteousness of God? Um, what this word righteousness really means is it's a word that means 
the word, the root word is right. And in the Greek language, D-I-K-E, D-K is the Greek word. It means the standard of what is right, the perfect standard. And so this bigger word, righteousness, means, it literally means in compliance with the standard, in perfect compliance with the standard. A person who is out of compliance with the standard is said to be unrighteous, but in compliance means, uh, uh, righteousness means in compliance with the standard. So what you could say is that he made him, Jesus, to be sin, that is to say out of, out of alignment, out of compliance. He made him to be sin that knew no sin, that we, and you could add there, that, that know nothing about righteousness, might be made to be in compliance with God. That's a good way to put that. In other words, he, a great exchange has taken place. That Jesus took everything wrong with us so that we in return could receive everything right with him. Now, I don't, if that's not good news to you, I don't know how to make it any better. <laughs> That's what it means when it says that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It means that we, He has brought us into compliance with everything that He could require. So we have really, in this relationship that we've entered into with God, we have no reason for fear, no reason for apprehension. It's all been His work. You notice in everything we read here, the only thing Paul intimated that we do in this is that we enter into it. We are reconciled to Him. In other words, He's reconciled to us. We get reconciled to Him. It's all His work, and we just enter into it by our faith in Christ. Okay, I think that's all i got today. Let's all stand up. God's message to you and to the world is that He's not mad. He's already brought us into His favor.